Welcome everyone. Um, we will get started in a couple minutes. Um, letting people, I see the participants, people are logging on. So um, just hold on and we will get started um, shortly. Thank you. Okay, so it's 11 a.m., so let's get started. Thank you everyone who's taken the time to join us today for our mental health forum series. Um, the topic today is addressing mental health during the COVID-19 outbreak Africa in Africa as healthcare systems brace for a battering. And today is gonna be a little different than our previous forums. It's gonna be a panel discussion between um, my colleagues, um, Dr. Bizu Galaye, who is an associate professor in psychiatry in the Division of Global Psychiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital, and also in the Department of Epidemiology at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And we're really lucky to have two of our colleagues and collaborators from Africa joining us. Um, it's really nice to see them and have the chance to catch up with them. So. We're joined by Dr. Um, Banga Chiliza, who is um, Associate Professor and Head of the Department of Psychiatry in the University of KwaZulu-Natal Kwa, Kwa Durban, South Africa. And Dr. Edith Kwoba, who is um, Consulting Psychiatrist and Head of the Department of Psychiatry at Moy Teaching and Referral Hospital in Eldoret, Kenya. Um, so thank you very much, Banga, and Edith for joining us and for B to Bizu for leading the discussion. Um, as people probably know, this is being recorded and will be available online after it's over. And we will, after um, a bit, we will be taking questions from the audience via the Q&A feature on Zoom, which you can see at, at the bottom of your screen. So if you po post the questions then, we will be able to post them to our speakers. Um, so thank you very much, and Bizu, why don't you take it away? Um, thanks so much, Kirsten. Thanks, uh, Bonga and Edith, for joining us. Um, you know, I remember um, on March 11, when the WHO declared COVID-19 as a pandemic, my um, thinking was what's going to happen to many places in Africa where we have um, weak healthcare systems, and over the past few weeks, we've seen the numbers going up and up. And the latest figure that I saw, the cases are more than 20,000 and the number of fatalities about uh, 1,200. And you know, those concerns, we see them every single day that uh, as the number of cases continue, people having discussions and governments talking about um, supporting the healthcare system. Um, particularly in diagnostic, therapeutics, and provision of PPEs for frontline healthcare workers, which are equally important, but oftentimes mental health is the last thing in the healthcare agenda. And, and I'm really excited to speak with you both uh, to learn more what's happening in frontline um, communities um, as, as you prepare for this, um, for this pandemic. Since we have a wide-ranging global audience uh, coming from different places, to just put things in context, can you um, spend a few minutes discussing what is the state of mental health care and delivery in South Africa and in Kenya prior to COVID-19? So I wonder if I could start with you, Edith, and, and then um, Bonga could follow up. <laughs> Thank you, Bizu. Thank you, Karistan. I really appreciate the opportunity to share this information with all of us and to learn from each other. I think that's the most important thing. So, yeah, you asked about the, mental, the state of mental health before COVID-19. And what I'll say about Kenya specifically, it is, I, it's a state that was improving. I'd say that for the longest time, we had very few psychiatrists 
we had uh, very few psychiatric nurses and most of the patients would be referred to major hospitals like Mathari Mental Hospital, which is somewhere in the city and few, uh, uh, a few other county hospitals. But I'd say that in the last two, three years, there's been an improvement in the number of psychiatrists that we are seeing in Kenya. And we've also seen some improvement in terms of the government's interest because previously the concentration has been on HIV and diabetes and other small deaths. So I, we have, well, in the minimal interest in mental health, it's quite some improvement. The government just wanted to do with the launching of the mental health policy 2015-2030, that started in implementing mental, mental health care programs at the community health health level and in private care settings. Then just in December, before the COVID-19 happened, we again, and this was necessitated by what we had been seeing on the headlines, a lot of suicides. Although we don't have good data on how much this was, it was very clear that the need was significantly increasing for mental health. And we saw the president appoint a task force in December so that they could assess the issues on the ground. And the other thing that we've seen previously, we would have Maybe a whole, like, I remember when I was started working in some part of Western Kenya, I was the only psychiatrist covering us a, 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 a whole region that had like 25 million Kenyans. But we have suddenly seen an increment in the number of trainees, and we are seeing a situation where in the next three or four years, we'll probably be graduating about 60 new psychiatrists. So basically, I'd say it has been, it was very bad in the past, where many patients had to travel long distances, and it was difficult to see a psychiatrist, and many people would either give up or try to get minimum care in primary care settings. But as we stood in December 2019, we would see some improvement. Of course, now that was sort of halted briefly by the COVID-19, but I felt like we were getting to a place of hope. Because the task force had even just collected information on what we can do, but uh, we hope that after, the, after this, the, the cloud passes, we are going to pick up from there and, and do what we were intending to do. Thank you, Bizu. Thanks, Edith. Um, can you, um, that's very interesting. Can you tell us a little bit about this presidential task force? Was that specific for mental health or um, was it in general for um, all healthcare providers? Interesting, it was actually for the mental health only. Uh, 47 counties and collecting views about um, what people think be done for mental health to make a difference. And this is very exciting for those of us think because for the longest time, uh, the, the president and the national government being too interested in mental health, we've seen interest in cancer and other things. So it was for mental health and the, they, they came around and they collected the views of both professionals and even people on the ground. They actually go to like a halls in the counties and ask people, do you, what do you want done for mental health? And giving Kenyans an opportunity to, to sort of air what they felt should be done for mental health. Of course, and like I said earlier, this was necessitated by an obviously observable need after the suicides and the homicides, and there was a lot of like outcry and an and undocumented need for an, something to be done for mental health. Thank, thank you, Edith. Um, Bonga? Yeah. Yeah, thanks, um, Bizu, and thank you very much, Bizu and Kirsten, for inviting us, uh, Edith and I, to speak. Um, I thought, you know, perhaps I'm going to speak from South Africa, so, um, and just give a little bit of background. I, I think um, whenever we talk about mental health care in South Africa, we really need to mention that the country is still fighting the quadruple burden of disease. So our health system is really um, struggling with HIV, with tuberculosis, with an increasing um, NCDs or non-communicable diseases, and also a lot of injuries due to motor vehicle accidents um, and other such and personal um, um, injuries. 
So we have that huge issue and obviously mental health care and I think as you know the rest of the of the continent is, is not obviously priority when there's all these other issues that, that the government has to deal with. Um, I think uh, South Africa is um, it's got a healthcare system that is divided roughly between the private sector and the public sector and our public or government sector really serves the majority of our population which is uninsured and I think the figures are more than 80% of the population's services are serviced by the public health sector. And the private sector um, serves the wealthy and middle class of our country that have medical insurance. And up until recently, that care was seen as generally world class um, if you're in the private health, if you're able to afford that kind of care. Um, we have about 850 psychiatrists in the country. Um, obviously a population of 55 million that's only 1.53 per hundred thousand um, our psychiatrists are mostly white and female and mostly actually work in the private sector majority of them in the big cities so in in, in Cape Town for example or Johannesburg um, we have uh, probably double the number of clinical psychologists um, compared to the psychiatrists and I think the it, how, how I would describe it, I mean, we are, I think we are fortunate in this country that we have had some really good data to try and describe our healthcare system. And there's been a couple of reports that just actually were released last year that have really helped us understand our system. So, for example, the South African Lancet uh, National Commission did a, released a report on the quality healthcare um, in South Africa. We had Competition Commission of South Africa do a market health inquiry that kind of looked at what's happening in the private sector. And we also had a, a, a really, a really top class national survey done by Crick Lens Group at UCT that looked at the mental health system costs um, in South Africa. And that looked at the public health, uh, mental health expenditure in our country. So uh, this data is quite interesting. And, and, and just maybe three things that I just wanted to share, and I'm sure we can. Um, unpack any, any of those things. But I think the way that our mental health care is organized in South Africa is really largely an inpatient service. Um, so the, the majority of our money by a long way goes towards care for patients in hospitals. Um, Crick Lund's um, article found that about more than 85% is on, spent on inpatient care. Um, and about half of that was actually spent in large psychiatric hospitals. So, We've been saying this for a long time that we really need to strengthen our patient care. We need to strengthen the district health services. And as you know, many people have been shouting that we need to talk a lot more about mental about health system strengthening, about integration into primary health care, particularly for common mental illnesses. Um, and this has been um, shown up recently that it's, it's a huge and urgent need. Um, and then lastly, I just want to say that um, we obviously, um, are really struggling with you know with human resources for mental health care. So um, although the numbers in South Africa are probably somewhat better than Kenya, um, but they're still far far from what we think should be the norms. And so we should be looking at how to uh, how to deliver our health care with uh, with this limited resources of psychiatrists and psychologists and nurses. That because we really uh, need to make sure that we're able to. Um, look at the competencies, if they're going to be leading large teams, you know, are, are they able to do that and is the curriculum um, set for such things. So those are, those are, I think, would probably, in a nutshell, would be the challenges um, that, have, that have beset our country prior to the COVID-19 challenge. Um, thanks, thanks, Bonga. And I think, you know, um, a follow-up to that, you know, the, this shortage in, in human resources and the number of psychiatrists and mental health professionals in, in some of the countries in, in Africa where uh, when states of emergencies were declared, I have seen, in, um, including in South Africa, that some doctors, irrespective of specialists, were called on to assist in testing and providing care. Has that happened in, um, let's say, um, in, in Durban or in Eldorado or other places in Kenya, um, what would the impact of that be on already um, stretched mental health care delivery and the big treatment gap that you, that you mentioned? 
Yeah, so do you want me to start or do you want yeah, Edith to start? Yeah, go ahead, Boga. Okay. So yeah, we've also had um, um, our government say that every health worker um, will have to, you know, all hands will have to be on deck, right? Everyone will have to help if you're, if you're a healthcare worker. And um, so there has been training for how to care for COVID-19 patients um, in all our hospitals. Um, uh, doctors and nurses have been, even in mental health care, have also been asked to take, um, to, they've been told that they may have to go and do swabs, for example, to test for COVID-19. Um, and I must say that um, there's been a huge amount of anxiety um, amongst our residents uh, and junior doctors in particular, because they will then just be the, the frontline people. Um, as you may know, um, some residents uh, choose psychiatry because they want to actually stay away from infectious diseases. Um, and so a lot of my residents have got are moms, they've got young babies, and so they're really worried about what that means. Um, and also in, in South Africa, and, and, and perhaps I'm not sure in Kenya, but in South Africa, there are also quite a few large psychiatric hospitals that are a little bit outside of the big cities. And, and this is, you know, really colonial uh, reasons. And so our government has kind of said, well, if you're in psychiatry, then we may have to redeploy you to go and work in a faraway rural psychiatry hospital, um, which, you know, some registers would say that they'd rather resign <laughs> than have to, you know, move and, and go and work there. So. I think um, there's a lot of anxiety about this and, um, you know, the psychiatrists feel also once again that uh, mental health care will then become neglected um, as obviously a lot of the funding will then uh, be redeployed towards or redirected to, to the fight for this pandemic. So those are the sort of the three things that I, I would wanted to say about that. Thanks, Mamba. Edith, do you want to have um, anything to add? Yeah, Africa not yet to like to manage the COVID patients, and I think it's mostly because we are still not overwhelmed. We have we had about just three hundred clients in the hospitals. That's not too many, and a number of them have even been discharged from hospitals. But I know the government has said everyone, every healthcare worker could be called upon. The doctors who I'd say who are in the because there's limited human resource for mental health. So we always look at our residents as part of the human resource for mental health. So when the university is closed, of course, the re most of the residents were called back to their counties. And yes, they are expected to help with that work. However, we are hoping that uh, we, we as a scientist do not necessarily need to go and help or giving antibiotics because we think they're meant to go for them, the medical aspects because we feel that the workload will definitely increase in terms of the mental health needs and therefore we feel that our work should really be limited to what we have been doing well not that we reject the patients i feel like where i am we have prepared ourselves in terms of training to be able to handle these patients but we do not want to just handle a general medical patient we want to handle a covid positive patient who, are, who is mentally ill so we are hoping that that won't come to pass but we are trained and prepared but we also want to keep insisting to the government that Mental health care is not less than physical health care. So we should not assume that the, we should all go. Some of us who are already few, I just said we are only about 120 or there about psychiatrists and less than 500 um, psych, uh, psychiatric nurses. And there is actually no scheme of service for psychology. So most of the psychologists are actually probably nurses or other people. That's not enough for the 40 million Kenya shillings in terms of mental health and psychosocial support. So we want to keep protecting our ground, but also be open to help if that is what is required. No, I'm, I'm, I, um, you know, I, I appreciate that, that response, Edith. I think um, it's, as Bonga said, this is, this is a situation where, you know, it's all hands on deck. Um, you just a follow up to that, Edith. Um, what are some of the activities that the mental health workers have been engaged in anticipation of increased cases? I have seen some messages in some places where training the frontline healthcare workers in anticipation of, um, you know, increased anxiety and, you know, uh, mental illness even um, for care providers. Can you talk a little bit about those activities that we've been doing um, in Kenya? And then I'll um, ask the same question to Bonga. 
Thank you. I think I will want to look at this from the national level and from where I am because that's where I'm, I'm more familiar with. So I want to start at Moi Teaching and Referral Hospital, which is a big referral hospital of the four national hospitals. And what we did is that uh, immediately this was declared a pandemic. There's a task force that was created and I was lucky as a psychiatrist to be considered to be part of it. I say lucky because most of the time mental health comes as an afterthought. So when I got in there and there was a lot of discussion about the COVID-19, the virus itself and all this stuff, I decided that it was important to also bring in a mental health aspect. So what I did, there was going to be a lot of trainings and I was involved in that and I ensured that there were two slides just discussing the mental health aspect. So I was not going to create my own parallel training, but I instead did two slides so that every person who did that training was going to have an aspect, understanding that at the end of it all, anxiety, depression might go up, and what can you do? Then with time, of course, we develop more comprehensive trainings, although those ones we were not doing it to everyone, we have been doing them in smaller groups. So the first thing is training. The other important thing is that as soon as this happened, there has been a lot of evaluation for clients and we've seen staff themselves like panic, especially when they are collecting samples. And so what we put out ourselves for is to support them. I remember there was uh, at one point a, a staff, a laboratory staff was collecting some sample and the client coughed and she almost went into a panic. So one of the things we've been doing is we had to actually sort of uh, give psychological first aid and support her and, uh, and throw out until the tests were negative to make sure that she's okay. So individual counseling has been what we've been doing, not just the psychiatrist, but also the psychological team that we have. Then the other thing is uh, that, that there's a lot of people who are on the front line trying to prepare like our hospital, including management and the people who are developing guidelines and they were under a lot of pressure. So one of the other things we thought was important is to have like, like I would call them group, group sessions, like debriefings, just having them talk and share with us what they are going through. The other thing, so that's at the boy teaching and referral hospital level training group and, and individual counseling sessions. But at the national level, we've also been tasked with developing guidelines. All of a sudden we realized that we were not very sure how we will treat a COVID positive patient who has a severe depression, for example, should they be in isolation? Should they be admitted into the mental unit? Should they be with everyone? So one of the things we did is started developing those guidelines so that at the end of the day, we are sure, will this patient be managed in a mental facility, for example, will they, they be in isolation center? The other thing I know that has happened with the mental health workers, especially in Nairobi, in the treatment centers, patients who already had mental illness relapsed. And so psychiatrists have had to come into this and review these patients and, and manage them appropriately. And the other important thing that we've been involved in is developing public education messages. Like if it's psychological first aid, we try to break it down into simpler content and share it with them. With the, with the public so that they can understand that during this time they are likely to feel anxious but help is available so it is developing guidelines it is messages it is training and then the government immediately even at the national level also set up a mental health and psychosocial support team with different teams who are supporting different people whether it's healthcare workers whether it is it's the task force the people who are really running up to do everything and also the, the community and members who are in quarantine Thanks, thanks, um, Edith. Are those guidelines available to share with other colleagues in, in the continent who um, may have the same set of um, circumstances and would be, would be um, beneficial to share with them? Is that something that is available? So there's one that has already publi been published on the website, the Mental Health and Psychosocial Support document. But the one that, the one that we just finalized a few days ago, the one for specifics of treating people with already existing mental illness. That one we are expecting that maybe by, by Monday or in the next coming days it will be out and yes, it can even be available on the, if we just went to the website of the Ministry of Health Kenya, it's actually available, but we'd be happy also to share. Perfect, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Edith. Uh, Bonga? Yeah, thanks, uh, Bizu and Bithi. It's, 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 I think we are doing very much similar work, and uh, as exactly as Edith said, and 
Yeah, it's it's yeah. It'll be good to sh to share these things so we don't have to duplicate as as you're suggesting, Bizu. Um, the one additional thing I wanted to mention was that in South Africa we've been um, also, uh, in addition to what she's mentioned, we've also been advocating for telepsychiatry. Um, and uh, our health professions council has, in the past, been uh, had a very strong stance against telepsychiatry. And so now they've relaxed it. And so um, they've said that, you know, for example, people, if you're a psychiatrist and your client um, uh, or a psychologist, your client, um, you already have a client, you can continue uh, with care by telepsychiatry. Um, and now we are still, though, uh, in the fight against uh, um, medical insurance companies to trying to get proper fair reimbursement, uh, which is also an issue because um, that has not been the case in the past. Um, and then the, the other thing I just want to mention, I think Edith mentioned it, I also just want to mention because we've been spending a lot of time as a society of psychiatrists, we've come together with um, other societies of uh, so-called frontline health workers, so to try and, and, and organize support for them. So the society, South African Society of Anesthetists, the Critical Care Society, South African Medical Association, and um, our Society of Psychiatrists, as well as the South African Depression Anxiety Group, have kind of come together and there's a network now of um, volunteer psychiatrists, psychologists that we organized around cities um, to try and help um, frontline workers that are in crisis. Um, so there's a number of psychiatrists and psychologists who've offered their services to do sort of brief crisis counseling, et cetera, for one or two sessions. Um, and then before then referring appropriately to nurses and doctors that are in the front lines. Um, some of them have also offered um, sort of uh, a more um, managerial to the, to the managers of the hospitals um, and much the things um, that are colloquially called team building and resilience training for, for the leaders of some of these teams. Um, I think that model is probably similar to what um, Greg Frisioni and our colleagues do at MGH. And so uh, we've just uh, launched that and, and it's actually happening already in, in Johannesburg uh, in South Africa. Um, that, that's very interesting, Bonga. Um, I think, you know, the issue of telepsychiatry also brings challenge, um, you know, including you know, how do you address issues related to stigma um, uh, to mental illness that already exists. And the other thing is, you know, this issue of digital divide, you know, who has access to mm. the kind of um, internet connection and be able to uh, utilize those services. I wonder if you could um, share um, your insights into that. Yeah, so th that's true. Thanks, Bizu. I mean, the, so first of all, the, um, the, the legislators, the Health Professions Council says that that we should be using video um, as a, a means of communicating. And we know that a lot of our people, even the ones that are middle class, um, often um, have smart devices that are not really good enough or they've never been on to Zoom. And so a lot of the psychiatrists in the private practice are saying that um, a lot of the patients are not taking up this opportunity um, of telepsychiatry because of, um, of that. So I think it is a huge issue. Um, there was, I know, uh, in the U.S. as well, a call about, um, you know, trying to um, relax the video thing and also use uh, just audio as a, as a means. And um, and that's, I'm not sure where that uh, fight is in the U.S., but in our country, I think it's a huge issue. So um, a lot of our colleagues in private practice are saying, actually, our patients are now, because we've been in lockdown for more than three weeks now, a lot of them are relapsing. And when, when the psychiatrist asked them, why didn't you, you know, we could have called me or we could have used WhatsApp um, to try and communicate. A lot of them have said either they're, they were very reluctant to do so or they um, just don't have the means or the, or, uh, or the bandwidth is not good enough for them to do video, video tele, um, teleconsulting. Thanks, thanks Wonga. Let me steer the conversation a little bit and, you know, just uh, talk about the population level, if it's, you know, we know that social cohesion and social gathering are really important traditional values um, and of great importance in many places in Africa. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the effects of lockdowns and you know, quarantine and um, physical distancing in the context where 
that might be impossible or even goes against the very ideals of you know uh, coming together in moments of crisis. Edith, I want can you maybe start? Yes, thank you. I think um, it, the, the effects of this lockdown are numerous, and I think I, I choose to look at them first in terms of how they have affected the social networks. As a community, we appreciate meeting. There are very there are some things that are very important to us. Weddings, are, you will you'll have five hundred or more people attend, and you've had. Um, are people either postponing or you see a wedding that's attended by 10 people that's totally unheard of and it's really affected people in that sort. There's the issue of funerals. We have our culture and we, we, we attend funerals. It's really a celebration of life as it were. And you've seen people really traumatized by the fact that, for example, they can't be able to attend funeral of someone who is very close to them and you can see even on social media people excel across cities for example now you can't go into Nairobi you're in Nairobi and someone has died probably 300 kilometers away you can't go and people it's really the social network has really been disrupted and for us who really love to meet it's really been a big deal. Then the other, so social networks and it's affecting people, religion, we, we are very religious people and, and we love to go to churches in numbers. And then and, and suddenly we can't go to church and there was a lot of, I remember the first time I was trying to talk to one of the, like a religious person because I, I go to church and he was very hesitant to have the church closed initially, of course, before the government directed. So, because he, he felt that we should be going to pray and we should believe that it should be well. So just a sudden change that we no longer can go to church. People feel a bit confused. Those of us who can afford uh, to listen to radio and TV, that's fine because they are offering those services on the video, radios and TVs. But many people feel a bit disillusioned. But other than the social networks being disrupted and people feeling like they, they, they don't know how to do it without the community that they have always been part of, it's a loss of livelihoods. And it's very distressing to see people who needed to go and, for example, hawk things on the streets, and that's what they depend on. And they suddenly they are told they cannot do that. The shops, some things like bars, where people have been drinking have been closed and 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 some many, many people who depend on a life and a living and suddenly they cannot And then one of the questions when they come on TV is COVID-19 and, and then provided a solution specifically for them. And I actually don't know what is happening to them. It, it's easy to know that maybe the middle class off for themselves, but you can imagine that person who depends on the $2 that they get on the street when they sell something. So that has really affected them. Of course, unfortunately, the people you see on social media expressing their concerns are the middle class who are probably concerned about the loss of social network, but we are aware that there are very many people on the ground whose livelihoods has been affected. There's been reports of, of things like, because people can't go to work, like domestic violence, of course, we don't have figures and facts of what, what, what like, we can't say 20%, it has increased by 20%, but we know for sure that there are families that are struggling because you're not used to your husband or around for 24 hours and they are not bringing anything because they probably lost a job and so people have the anxiety and there's no money and people figures issues of domestic violence are likely to go up so yeah the effects on the society the schools being closed i have a daughter who is a candidate and she keeps asking me mama am i going to sit exams for example because we see the last that exam is very important because that's what determines the kind of high school you go into and suddenly they are at home some of us are lucky that they can do some classes there are some schools that have been sending homework but you can imagine for some families like in the in the slums where they don't have even a place to sit and do the homework leave alone have a zoom class with a teacher so the government says the exam they still see the exams but we believe that it will affect some students who might be disadvantaged and maybe not get a very good high school and that impacts the rest of their life so it's it's, it's emotions it's um, the social network it's livelihoods being affected and we are really hoping that it doesn't last too long because we believe that 
that the consequences of that are likely to be long lasting beyond the epidemic, the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks, thanks, Edith, for that, um, you know, uh, comprehensive overview. It, it just goes beyond um, just the, um, you know, the emotional well-being, but also touched across um, many facets of life, including, you know, uh, the economic livelihood of many people who depend on um, the social gather gathering and the social cohesion. Uh, Bonga? Yeah, Abizu, I think Edith has really covered most of what I wanted to say. I think the, the other point that I, the only point that I just want to add, I think, um, with uh, Edith is that, to Edith is that, I, I think the challenge, I must say, must, is, is enormous for governments because in a country like South Africa where the inequality is, is so great. Um, you know, I think that, um, you know, so for example, in South Africa, there's hard lockdown, which literally means you have to stay in your house or in your home, uh, and you can't, um, you can't even go for a jog um, outside. You're not allowed to do that. You can only leave the house if you're going for, um, to go get food um, or to the pharmacy. And so, as Edith has said, right, the middle class are up in arms, like, oh, I want to go for a jog. I want to, you know, I want to be able to, to take my dog for a walk. Um, and, and yet there are people that are living in shacks that are on top of each other that are really, really struggling. And so how do you make laws that will kind of cater for both sides of, um, of this inequality is really, really difficult. I, I'm not sure how, how one does that. Um, you know, on TV, we often see people who live in, in shacks who are being interviewed and they say, well, you know, there's four of us in this one room shack. How do I stay in, in, in this shack the whole day? Uh, I'm hungry, I need to try and look for food. Um, you know, how do I, um, do I, do I need to die of hunger or you know, must I take my risks and die of, of this uh, virus? So I think that, that for me, I think is in South Africa particularly is, is really stark, the, the contrasting um, effects um, following the, you know, of the COVID stuff um, with the inequality. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, Bonga, earlier you mentioned about the quadruple uh, burden and, and particularly, I think, you know, um, there's an experience of, you know, handling the mental health impact uh, related to HIV and, um, and TB. Are you using um, some of the experience learned um, in addressing some of the, the stigma and the mental health issues related uh, to HIV into this new pandemic? Yeah, I think that, that that's something that I really would like us to... Um, perhaps when there's a bit more time to think a little bit about what that means, because, um, you know, there are people that have, you know, given opinions that, you know, Africa should um, probably be better off and be more resilient because they've had to fight off uh, pandemics like HIV, um, like Ebola in the West Africa and, and, and other um, infectious diseases. But, you know, it's, it's not clear to me because we don't have the data to, to try and, and show how this, how this works. Um, I, I think that our government, I must say, I just wanted to commend them that they did act um, swiftly and early. Um, certainly in South Africa, I've, I've got colleagues in Botswana who also said the same thing, that the government acted really early and, and, and got these measures done for lockdown. And that's probably, you know, one can postulate that is probably due to the fact that they've had um, previous uh, experiences with these things uh, and they've seen the deadly effects of, of, of HIV. Um, I think I'm hopeful and I'm optimistic at the moment, but we know uh, in the past that previous presidents um, in South Africa have then, you know, initially would listen to scientists who give um, the advice and then, um, you know, at other times then turn to other people and, and we've had, you know, the great AIDS dissidents uh, advising our, our president um, Beggy in the past in our country. So I don't want to be too hopeful and too optimistic, but I think at the moment, I think um, they can be commended in what they've done. I know I, I I agree. I think you know in many ways I'm heartened to see the kind of collective leadership that has come out of you know many places in listening to the scientists and, and putting measures in place. I think in many ways those public health measures are uh, going to be really critical. Um, I, we have uh, quite a number of questions. Maybe let me pose one last question um, you know, because you mentioned it, Edith. Uh, you've talked about. Um, increased suicide prior to COVID-19. Do you have any data what is happening um, 
around this pandemic? Do you, have, do you have any data coming out whether that continues to be a problem or um, are there any challenges? I think the hope is that there will be studies. Some of us are put out into our IRBs, uh, some studies. Of course, you have to go through the usual processes of uh, clearance. So there are not yet studies to confirm whether that has increased. And maybe what we might see is more of anxiety this time, not necessarily the suicide from the group of things. But we already know that there are some patients, there's a, or at least we know one who are feeling committed suicide because of this, that was reported on news. But we also know that what is reported is not necessarily science. And there could be many other who the family sort of cover up. We also know that there was a case of homicide because of stigma in a certain place in our country. So we know that this could be high and we are hoping that people will collect a little more data, but not yet out there. All right, um, thanks, Edith. So uh, we have quite a number of questions. We've over 200 participants online and they've asked a number of questions and I'll try to um, do those questions. But, uh, you know, Kirsten, do you have any questions before I open up the floor to the wider audience? Um, thank, you. Um, thank you, Bizu, and thank you, um, Banga and Edith, for um, questions so far. Um, there were a couple questions that I want to just flag that were put in the chat instead of in the, um, in the Q&A. So one of the questions that was asked early is around um, um, the ways that mental health units are set away from the rest of the hospitals in certain places and um, that could make them places for quarantine or isolation and wondered if those had been suggested as possible as possibilities in Eldoret or Durban. Um, yeah, so in Durban, actually our, our hospital, our psychiatric units are very much in, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. In Durban, uh, most of our psychiatric units are actually in the general hospitals um, and not um, aside, um, away from the rest of the hospitals. And so... Uh, in fact, the, in Durban, the, the one hospital that has been um, thought of as, as possibly, or well, there's two hospitals that have been thought of potentially suitable. One is a new hospital that has been built that was um, not yet commissioned. I think that's what the guidelines say, that you consider those hospitals. Or there was one hospital that was a, sort of a, a convalescent hospital, a step-down facility um, that I think is the one that they've gone for and that they're trying to, to, um, to set up. Uh, so we haven't um, had any issues about trying to <laughs> say, no, please don't uh, leave our mental health units uh, here in, in, this, in this country, in the city. Edith? So I think it's similar. Most of the mental health care services are provided within general hospitals, except in one, actually three hospitals in the country where they are sort of independent, but they do have had to work with like maybe one ward. So they are not saying we won't admit mental ill patients who have COVID, but they have had to identify spaces within them. But the rest of the hospitals are well supported because they have general medical wards. So that would not be a problem. That's, um, yeah, thank you. That was something I was really curious about. And then another question I had, which also has been in the chat, um, is around, um, if you mentioned the public education campaigns and breaking down psychological first aid for different populations that's been done. Um, and is there, is there anything specific from that that you think thinks has been very particularly effective or something we can learn from there? I don't know whether we have measured, we, we haven't measured about the effectiveness. I think what we've been doing is really just training, training and really hope that people can take it up and use it. But we haven't gotten to a point where we can evaluate whether those who you trade are actually utilizing it and whether it's making a difference. So that would be probably some of the things we do. How many people did you train and did they actually practice it the way it's done, like sort of some implementation science of some sort, but not yet. We are not sure. We just keep doing it and hope that it's being utilized. Yeah, also, um, and I want to agree with Edith. I think there, um, there's been quite a bit of work being done around that. And um, 
um, you know, anecdotally, people are saying that it's very well received, this kind of um, training that is happening with um, uh, healthcare workers um, in different cities in South Africa. Um, but I, I'm not sure if anyone is actually, um, at the moment, has started um, doing any formal evaluation of that. I think it, 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 I was surprised actually by how much the mental health care stuff got picked up by the media in South Africa um, quite early on actually. Um, with, with a lot of radio, I did myself and a number of colleagues in South Africa did quite a few radio interviews um, across the country with different languages actually. And a lot of those um, uh, radio hosts were actually going on about, you know, doing moderate exercise in the house and doing all of these things and avoiding to drinking too much. and. And so the messages, um, for some reason, have been quite um, well taken up by the people that are, are running this talk show host. So it's been interesting. So along those lines, and then I will shut up and let uh, these you answer our question. Um, I, someone asked me, this a reporter uh, from Wired asked me this last night about the US, so I want to pose it to you. Do you see any positive around mental health coming out of this? whether um, more awareness or perceptions about mental health or reduced stigma or understanding that it's common. So really anything wide open. So I've been thinking about that since Hila asked me last night. So I wanted to throw that at you. And I know you, you weren't given this question ahead of time. So whatever, this is just open your thoughts. I don't have any agenda or answer myself. Yeah, and if I have to talk about Kenya, I feel like for the first time we'll have a scheme of service psychologists and counselors. For the longest time, the government, so we have counselors and psychologists who work as nurses, well, except Moi Teaching and Referral Hospital and Kenyatta National Hospital, but the main, the, those which are national referral hospital and sort of government entities, but in the main public health sector, there are no people who are hired as psychologists and counselors. But suddenly, the government is talking about them, and sometimes you laugh, you wonder, you never hired them, where are they meant to be? So one of the exciting things for me is that we will get a scheme of service for psychologists and counselors. The other thing is there's a lot of talk, like the Kenya Medical Association has been doing something called physician wellness and it's mental health. I was so impressed yesterday they had a webinar on some mental health issue and 500 people who are healthcare workers actually logged in to listen. It, I, I feel like we will not return where we were in December 2019 because people are more aware and people are more appreciative. I've received a number of calls from doctors specifically who said I'd like to talk to you. Most of the time people don't want to talk to us, psychiatrists, about their mental health issues. They think they can sort them up. But you can see that certain people are recognizing I need to talk to someone. So yes, I think we've moved some steps ahead. And if COVID never happened, we'd probably have remained where we were. Yeah, I want to echo that last bit, uh, Edith. Um, that I, I really think that um, for me, the one impact will be our, amongst our medical colleagues. Um, I think that um, I think prior to COVID, actually, there's, there had been quite a lot of um, um, studies done around burnout amongst, particularly amongst junior doctors in this country, um, and some the medical association and as well as our society was trying to uh, organize platforms to deal with physician burnout and. Um, I think that is going to be probably a lot more important um, and, and, and much more in the spotlight going forward. Um, so I would want to second um, what Edith is saying around our colleagues. Great, thank you. I'll let Yuzu ask some questions from the chat now. Okay, all right, thanks, thanks Kat, and thanks Volga and Edith. Um, we have quite a number of questions that I'm going to uh, just choose and, um, and ask you some, some questions. And apologies in advance um, if your question was not asked. Um, so one question that Walter asked from Zimbabwe is, is there a triage system in your facilities before admission or entrance to outpatients? Or is there some sort of screening that is employed? Yeah, so if everyone who's in a hospital now gets screened and, you know, um, they're asked uh, certain questions and if they screen positive, then they get tested um, for COVID, everyone, um, regardless of what you're coming for in the hospital. Um, the, the, the difficulty is that we still don't have uniformity around what we then do with those patients, particularly in the psychiatric wards. Um, so obviously, depending on resources, some people are saying, um, 
we should have, you know, divide the ward into three different sections where the ones that are positive on one side, the ones that are, you know, suspected are in the middle and then keep them there or isolate them for five days. So there's been a lot of discussion around that, um, about how we do that exactly. Um, and we don't, uh, each hospital at the moment is doing it um, differently and we don't have uh, agreement yet, uh, unfortunately, of, of how we're going to be handling that for inpatient care in our, in our facilities. I think it's the same in Kenya. So like in Moi Teaching and Referral Hospital, by the time you get to the gate, your temperature is taken, you are taken through a series of questions on the core symptoms and the history of contact. And, and, and similarly, we don't have a place where we are separating. But we are hoping to use the index of suspicion to test. We still don't have too many test kits available, so we can't just test anyone who is coughing, for example. Uh, but we are hoping that uh, as soon as uh, we have enough testing kits, maybe everyone who has a cough or, or fever then will be tested, but not yet there. We're just screening and hoping that we are getting it right. Um, There's another question, uh, which is also um, related to this, but there has been concerns about personal protective equipments for healthcare workers in many settings. Um, what is your hospital stance on PPEs for healthcare workers working with patients who have severe mental illness who will not be able to do the recommended social distancing or hand washing practices? Yeah, I think we are going to be in big trouble with that. Hey? And, and if it's happening in high income countries, high resource countries, we are also going to be in big trouble. Um, yeah, so, um, there's already been an outcry from junior doctors and nurses in some hospitals to say if they don't have proper protective equipment, then they can't, they can't work. Um, I think in, in, in Durban, certainly the numbers have been such that uh, we are still able to, to continue working as we should, you know, with proper protection uh, at the moment. We haven't been overwhelmed yet. Um, but there have been uh, nurses, uh, unions, uh, union leaders of nurses have already um, threatened to take the government to court if the government uh, asks us to continue uh, working with uh, without proper protection or equipment. Um, um, all psychiatrists who have patients like this have all saying that it's, it's extremely difficult to get uh, inside a psychiatric ward someone who's got um, severe mental illness to do what is expected to do in, in terms of um, as physical distancing and on all and wearing masks etc they try and give the masks and but a lot of uh, patients um, um, really struggle with that so yeah so we need to um, to don on our full gear and and psychiatrists are unfortunate are unfortunately or are doing so um, and, and even though it's you know it's not something that they're used to doing um, thanks Bonga. maybe Edith um what are you doing in your uh, population um, mental health strategies? Are there plans to reaching certain populations such as homeless people or um, key, um, groups that are at higher risk such as female sex workers and, and other key demographics? Read your message out. I, I think I missed that out, Bizu. Yeah, so, um, yeah. How are you doing in terms of reaching people who may need mental health care, um, but may not necessarily have access to the kind of services like telemedicine in areas and populations such as female sex workers or homeless populations? I must confess, especially because of the limited numbers that we have in terms of human resource, our focus has been on what we have always done and optimizing it. And, and we haven't, uh, other than the messages that are going to the public, we haven't identified them yet as people we want to address, but I think it's a consideration for future. Maybe South Africa is doing better than us. So we, have just, we are just doing what we are doing for the general public. Give information and, and let them think about how they can array their anxiety, but not exactly going down to assist them as as. Bonga, do you have anything to add? 
Um, sorry, Mr. I was reading the Q&A. <laughs> um, yeah. the, what happened in South Africa um, is that when lockdown um, took place, um, um, about, about more than three weeks ago now, they actually went and rounded up all the homeless people and took them to shelters. Um, and in Durban, uh, in my city, we were, um, you know, within a few days, literally, there were obviously people having severe drug um, withdrawals, um, alcohol withdrawal and other drug uh, withdrawal symptoms. And so uh, we are very fortunate that psychiatrists volunteered to go there and help, um, you know, um, give medication at those shelters. Um, we also obviously then found a lot of people with severe mental illnesses that are uh, have been collected um, by the police and um, and one of our community psychiatrists then started putting them back onto the medication. Um, so luckily we do have a community psychiatrist in Durban who was able to do that otherwise I think the hospitals that have been full with those patients um, who are now suddenly um, in one space and, and, and started to relapse. Um, maybe I think you know this is uh, also a question posed uh, for uh, Bonga do you have are governments doing anything to provide support um, with this increased food insecurity uh, to provide food uh, for folks who may not be able to afford or uh, go out and uh, be able to work? Um, yeah, so there has been quite a big uh, initiative and drive, not just from government, but uh, a lot from the non-governmental organizations, the NGO sector, um, to try and get those uh, food parcels. There's a number of people that have kind of, civil society has really banded together to try and organize to, to do that. Um, it's, there's no doubt that it's um, not in the scale that it should be. Um, there was a huge outcry, for example, when the schools closed, that um, a lot of those kids, um, some of, a lot of those kids, uh, get uh, the only meal of the day that they get is from those feeding schemes at the schools. And so if they're not able to go to school, they'll be in, in huge trouble. Um, last night, our president uh, announced um, more measures, um, another uh, measures to try and, and help uh, with, uh, with, you know, I think they're going to have to obviously go and borrow money from the IMF and the World Bank to try and, and help out um, loan, uh, uh, the, the poor people. So there's, there's some measures, for example, like an income um, grant. Um, so people will get a little bit of money um, when all, all of this is over to try and help them with that. But food insecurity is a huge issue. And um, there's already been some looting of food trucks uh, in Cape Town, actually, uh, yesterday or, or over the weekend, where um, they were trying to deliver that food and people just um, saw it and started um, running towards the food truck to try and, and get whatever they can. Um, so yeah, I think it's 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 really really difficult. Um, thank, thanks, Bonga. I, this is something that I have seen in various discussions, which is engaging community health workers. Um, I wonder, is there any thinking in terms of using um, community health workers for? mental health screening, um, is there any discussion um, in your plans? Yeah, so that's the next step that the government has, uh, in South Africa has said that they want um, community health workers to go out and screen as many people as they can for, for COVID-19. And, um, and uh, prior to this, there's colleagues at, at UKZN, um, Professor Inga Peterson and other colleagues who've been doing quite a bit of work to, to add a mental health component to the training of the community health workers. So um, we believe that some of them have already been skilled a little bit more um, in terms of um, looking for to screen for mental health and perhaps even um, um, being able to um, know how to um, triage the ones that require uh, further care. But uh, I just wanted to say though, Bizu, that that has now created another challenge, which is about uh, PPE for community health workers. So the government is willing to get them, uh, you know, to go out there and train them. But, uh, if, you know, this, we're talking about thousands of people and uh, the government is just not going to be able to afford to get proper protective equipment for all those uh, community health workers uh, that they're sending out into the community. Edith, um, do you have anything to add to the community health workers question? No, I, I, the situation is the same. I think it's a tricky balance between using them because they are more accessible to especially the people who 
who don't have internet. So the thoughts have been around using them to especially deliver messages for prevention. But again, they could be, if you, they keep going and they don't observe the hygiene, if they could be the ones also spreading. And then are they able to do this where they are keeping the one meter distance? So those have been the challenges, but yes, in terms of uh, their usefulness, it's been thought about, but the, call, the logistics are a bit complex. So I think people are still refining them as we go along. Um, thank you both. I think, you know, I'm mindful of the time, but let me ask just this one last question. Um, when both Karsten and I thought of the session, one of the things is just from the selfless feeling, that uh, helpless feeling that, you know, what can we do to help? Is there anything that we can help in, in assisting in your efforts? Um, you're doing amazing work, uh, but is there anything that, that uh, you know, the Global North can do in assisting you in activities that um, that you're working on to prepare for the increased numbers in your settings. So, uh, from our side, I think the, the at the moment the priority um, uh, from from our, my colleagues and us is, is really that we need more um, information or access to um, you know information that is um, freely available. Um, I think. Uh, a lot of these, a lot of these articles, a lot of colleagues are in private practice. They just don't have access to libraries that can get them the latest JAM article. And uh, the kind of, um, if it were possible to have access to the kind of repositories that your school has, um, these would be would be really amazing at, at this time. That would probably be the the number one concern for for a lot of our colleagues. Are saying they they want to keep up, they want to read and see what the latest is on COVID. Um, management, but they're, they're really struggling to get access to, to the right materials. And I think just like uh, what Ponga has said, there's the ability to get more information to, get, to keep getting better at what we are doing in terms of intervention. And maybe the other important aspect that comes to my mind is the area of research, especially the one that would be interventions to improve outcomes, as opposed to epidemiological aspects of it. I think it's good to be able to do sort of some implementation stuff that will improve and, and hopefully ensure that the outcomes in terms of mental health are not, are not as bad as we, we fear. Uh, thank you so much, Bongo and Edith. Really appreciate for you taking the time um, to share your knowledge and perspective with us. Kirsten, uh, do you have any yeah, final Thank you so much, Banga and Edith and Bizu. Um, Banga and Edith, you guys are an inspiration to me and I feel lucky to have been able to work with you all these years and will continue and we'll be back to visit, I hope in South Africa and Kenya soon and hopefully we can bring you to Boston soon. And I sure. tell you about the freely available information and the research. So we will, um, we will work on that and see how we can help with that. Um, just an announcement about next week's forum. We'll um, have a lot, some of the themes that we heard in this week's. Next week's will be um, about the disparities um, that have been brought into focus with COVID-19. Um, specifically, COVID-19 brings persistent racial and ethnic disparities to focus implications for population mental health. And this will also, again, be um, led by um, Bizu and myself, and the speakers will be Dr. Maggie Alegria, Dr. Cindy Liu, and Dr. Kim Leary. So please join us for that. And thank you again, Bonga and Edith, and stay well and safe. And my um, love to you and your families. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Kiss. Thank you very much for inviting us. Thank you, Patterson. Thank you. Thank you.